Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Kerner, um, we have heard from GAO and the NASA IG about the importance of cost transparency for Artemis. Artemis is not just one system, it, one mission or even one capability. Um, it's a set of increasingly complex missions and activities. Um, NASA now has successfully completed Artemis One. Could you explain how, how NASA is, is documenting the lessons that we have learned in Artemis One such that we are applying those lessons to Artemis Two and Three. Certainly. So we did a very extensive lessons learned process coming out of Artemis One that enabled us to, at every level within the organization and within the hardware production, whether it's at the contractor level or NASA doing integration and analysis, to be able to factor that into the Artemis Two learning as well as future missions. As I indicated previously, we have we are. We have a lot of missions in flow and in, in um, development simultaneously. What that does is it enables us to, when we learn a lesson on Artemis One, we can flow that into all of the development that we have currently ongoing. It also allows us if, for example, we've already built some equipment for Artemis Two, we already have Artemis Three at nearly the right level in its production to be able to make modifications to that hardware and then bring it forward to incorporate it into Artemis Two, just as an example. So having the rich, I'll say, um, production cadence that we have established with our Artemis missions and our hardware has enabled us to be able to incorporate all of those lessons learned. I will also note to the comment about the cost and cost transparency. One of the challenges that we face in answering a permission cost is our contracts are set up to do bulk buys. In other words, we get if I go buy three of something, I can get it less expensive than if I buy one of something three times. So when we have established our contracts and we purchase some of our equipment, those bulk buys give us cost savings. But what those do is it lumps costs together in by program and by purchases. It doesn't allow us, we don't, for example, get appropriations for Artemis missions. I don't get an Artemis I appropriation and an Artemis II appropriation. I get one for SpaceX, excuse me, for HLS, for Orion, for the Space Launch System. So aggregating those costs where we'd make bulk buys and we make purchases based on different contract mechanisms makes it very challenging for us to put together a permission cost. But we are very transparent in the cost numbers that we have with the contract structures that we have in place and with the way that we are appropriated. So you would say that it is an investment. Artemis one is an investment in two, and then two is an investment. All in of these missions build on each other, yes, sir. Great. Um, you know, humans landed on the lunar surface in 1969. In the year 2024, we still use some of the same technology um, that was developed, you know, some 55 years ago. And I like to say that we wouldn't have uh, computers in our pockets if we didn't uh, have that investment. Uh, so, Ms. Kerner, could you speak to what returning to the moon and eventually going to Mars will mean for the science and technology of tomorrow? Yeah, if, if you'll permit me an analogy. So, so I was here, by the way, and watched Apollo 11 astronauts walk on the moon. Um, so I remember that, and I remember the inspiration that that was to me and to, to those from my generation. Um, the analogy that I'll use for you is, right, a car today and a car from the early 1900s look pretty similar in some regards. They have a steering wheel, they have wheels, they transport people, any number of people depending on the design. But when you look inside the engine, they're very different. They're very different machines. The technology that we're going to the moon with this time is very different. And the te technologies that we're developing are actually developing entire industries to support those technologies. Industries, craft trades, that things of that nature that are helping the economic engine of the United States as well as our partnering countries. Um, I, I lived in East Texas um, and I remember everything about that Saturday morning when Space Shuttle Columbia disintegrated. Um, I, I still feel it to this day. Um, next week, we will recognize NASA's Day of Remembrance to honor the heroes uh, that made that ultimate sacrifice to advance our nation's space flight and uh, exploration programs. Um, I know my time is waning. Um, how do we plan to communicate the upcoming risk um, as, as we continue to go farther? 
Uh, would anyone like to answer that? Uh, I would like to at least start out by doing that. So many of us live through the tragedy of Columbia, and many of us witness the tragedy of Challenger as well. And those of us who are still within, within the agency take those lessons very seriously. And we make sure that, that when we have a day of remembrance, we remember not only the, the tremendous lives that these people lived and the sacrifices that they made, but we remember why we do what we do and why we are so focused on risk and on safety, which is the reason, for example, we did not hesitate to adjust the launch date for Artemis II when it became evident that safety was of utmost importance with the challenges we were facing. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair.